I'm going to talk to you tonight, even though I've just suffered a small emotional tragedy. Um, I learned outside in the atrium from the spider lady that my beloved spider that lives in my kitchen windowsill may die tonight because of the cold. <laughs> this is a spider that I've watched in my window for about two months now, and I had researched and have my coffee with every morning. <laughs> And I'm like, should I call my husband and see if there's some way we can arrange heaters? <laughs> but I know that this is part of the great cycle of nature and that I just have to accept this and move on. So even though I'm a little, I'm a little emotional, I'm going to continue. This is part of the science desk at NPR. Um, I don't know how many of you have experience at newsrooms, but um, we have different groups of people that we call desks. So there's the national desk, the international desk, the arts and culture desk, and then I'm part of the science desk. And NPR has a really big science desk. I mean, we have like 40 people whose job it is to just cover science. And that includes health and medicine, of course, but also, you know, physics. This is just a small sample. I kept trying to, to get a picture of everyone. I had this vision that I would take this picture and show it to you, and I was really excited about the opportunity because we don't take a lot of pictures at work. You know, think about all the pictures you take of your family, but at work you spend so much time with these people and you never really take group pictures like this. And so I thought this is a great excuse to get everybody together for a big group picture. And so I scheduled a group picture and then there were meetings and then somebody had an interview and can you change it? And so I scheduled it again and I scheduled it again and I scheduled it again. And finally I was just like, look, we're doing it at three o'clock. Whoever can show up outside of this recording booth, I'm taking your picture. So this is really just a very small sample, but it gives you a sense of the type of people who work on the NPR science desk. So that guy sitting sort of crouched down at the bottom of the white pillar, that's Joe Palka. So he's one of our on-air correspondents. That guy there in the corner with the sort of goatee and the glasses, that's Jeff Broomfield. The guy in the red sweater is Rob Stein. Uh, the lady leaning against the pillar with the white scarf on, that's Allison Aubrey. So those are some on-air people. But then we also have um, three editors there. So we have science editors who sort of keep an eye on us and make sure we don't say anything stupid or wrong. And then there's also um, a number of people for the digital side. Um, now NPR isn't just radio. We have a huge um, visual and online presence. And so we have people who are just on the science desk working with us to make our stories not just sound good, but look good. This is Richard Harris. <laughs> He was really sad because he was wanting to be in the group photo, and then just when it was happening, the World Health Organization called him in a call that he'd been waiting for for some time, and so he couldn't be in it. And so I promised him that I would take an extra picture of him <laughs> and bring it to show to you. But it also gives you a little bit of a sense of our office. We just moved into a new building, so it's not quite so, you know, crummy and cluttered as it used to be. Now it's all sort of like a spaceship. It's very bright and clean, but we're working hard to fill it with junk. <laughs> so these are two numbers that I feel very emotionally close to. We do a lot of um, surveys and uh, questions of our listeners to try to understand, you know, who are our listeners and, you know, what, what are they interested in? What do they want? And this top figure, 83%, is the percentage of our listeners who say they're interested in learning more about how the universe works. That's actually one of the questions they asked. And a closely related figure is 82%. And these are the number of listeners who say they're interested in learning about information of no possible relevance to their lives. <laughs> <laughs> that number makes me feel really good. Because who really needs to hear a story about ancient cave art? You know, who really needs to hear about tracking narwhals in Greenland, you know, or dark matter, right? I mean, do we need these things or is this going to help us the next time we're at the store? Is this going to help us, you know, resolve family conflicts? No. <laughs> but people want this stuff and that's good because that's what I want to give it to them. Um, so the question is, here we have these listeners, here we have these people, how do we decide what we're going to tell them. Because the number of people doing science and engineering is huge. Um, there are so many possible stories out there. 
There are countless scientific publications. All the time there are scientific conferences. We have a lot of choices about what we put on our air. And in terms of our audience, what will appeal to our audience? You know, we have a really diverse group of people who listen to NPR. I mean, it's not just scientists, it's not just educators, right? I mean, we have, you know, taxi drivers, cooks, accountants, you know, computer programmers, plumbers, this huge group of people. We have young people who are trapped in the back of the car, strapped down, being forced to listen to what their parents have on the radio. Sometimes I think about them and I think, okay, let's give these kids something they would like. So when people at the science desk think about, well, what are we going to cover? What are we going to put on the air that we think is important enough to basically take up a little sliver of the lives of millions of people, right? That's what you're giving to us. You're giving to us your time, which is a piece of your life, right? So to me, that's very sacred. I take it very seriously. When we think about what we're going to do with that gift that you're giving to us, we think about some general categories, OK? One category is stuff that just happens. So this picture is after the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. They collected all of the debris in an attempt to understand the accident, to understand what happened. Something like that is a category of science story that we have to cover. There's no choice in that, OK? People want to hear it. We want to cover it. It's important. It's, it's obvious. Um, another example in this category would be the anthrax attacks. Or there was in Russia, I don't know if you remember, um, a huge space rock just suddenly hit the atmosphere right above Russia and broke windows and set off car alarms. I mean, something happens, right? <laughs> this is what we say in the newsroom. The news is so inconvenient. It just happens. <laughs> um, so no matter what you have planned that day, something major, something big will just suddenly happen. Um, and that's one of the exciting things about being in a newsroom. Another important category that we think about is a category I would sort of describe as the no way category. And that would be major scientific developments. So this is Dolly, the sheep, right? First clone of her type. If they clone a sheep, we're going to cover it. <laughs> There's no question. There's no debate at the science desk. We're going to cover that like volcanic ash. The first Earth-like planet circling another star that's discovered, again, that's going to get covered. You know, the existence of the Higgs confirmed, we're going to cover that. Um, typically, this type of thing is published in a major journal like Science or Nature, and, or maybe there'll be a press conference or something like that. And things like this, typically reporters know about it in advance because the journals or the institution will give us some heads up, some advance warning. Um, so it's not like one of these stories that just sort of you know, happens very suddenly. Another category is just sort of ain't nature strange kind of stories. This is the kind of story that people just like. If there's a dinosaur story, we have to seriously consider doing it because people just love dinosaurs. And again, for the kids in the back seat, let's give them something. Or a story on giant squid eyes, which apparently are like the biggest eyes um, in the animal kingdom. Or a story about sharks or, you know, charismatic megafauna doing strange things like an elephant that can talk. Um, Black holes, what makes humans human, um, the minds of babies. You know, people cannot get enough of this stuff, right? This is what they want to hear about. And for the most part, we're pretty happy to tell them because it's interesting. A closely related category in my mind is stuff that reminds people of grade school science. Because many people, that's the science they learned. You know, if they don't go on to take advanced science classes in high school or in college, that sort of fundamental science that you learn in grade school is what sticks with people. You know, no matter what they go on to do in their career, it really sticks with people. It's like part of their DNA. So things like um, Pluto, you know, remember the whole debate about Pluto? That's going to be a huge story because we all had to memorize the planets, you know? And if you're going to kick out Pluto, I mean, come on. The public is emotionally invested in Pluto <laughs> in a way that it's not other things. Um, another example would be I did a story about the shape of an electron. Scientists trying to measure with unprecedented precision what shape is an electron. You know, is it round, really? And I feel like how many of us as kids made like models of the atom, right? Um, so stories that fall into that category are things that people will really care about. 
One category um, is sort of the intersection of science and policy. What does science say about a policy? Or are people trying to interfere or manipulate science to support a policy they want? You know, there's debates over climate change, of human embryonic stem cells, um, whether or not to approve certain genetically modified organisms, right? So there's, there's a lot of policy. Another would be how science can change your life. There is some interest now into more and more genetic testing of newborns, and some people are saying genetic sequencing is so cheap and easy now, maybe we should get everyone's genetic sequence, you know, right when they're born. Um, but some ethicists have said, well, does that mean that as soon as your baby is born, you could get a sort of preview of, like, health problems way later in life? That, you know, how is that going to change how we see our children? You know, to have that kind of information, that could really change people. Then there's a kind of story that I think NPR really likes to do, um, which is, what makes scientists scientists? <laughs> How do scientists think? This is a picture of some flasks of E. coli bacteria that a researcher has been watching since 1988. It's an experiment in evolution. And so in 1988, he took a bacteria and divided it and divided it and put into 12 flasks identical starting bacteria and then has just been feeding them and watching them since then. <laughs> it's a really long-term experiment. I mean, we think about evolution, you tend to think of fossils and you tend to think of looking back in past to, to understand how things evolved to be the way they are today. But this is a very different kind of experiment. This is like, let's follow evolution in real time and just see what in this very, very simple system, you know, just these simple bacteria in this simple, tiny little world, <laughs> You know, are these 12 flasks going to say the same? Are they going to evolve in the same ways? Are they going to evolve in different ways? And um, this guy has been watching them for more than 60,000 generations. So just imagine if you could follow human evolution for 60,000 generations. You know, what, what we would look like 60,000 generations from now. Interestingly, you know, at certain points in this long-term experiment, which is still going on, by the way, um, you know, this guy thought, well, this is maybe there hasn't been much happening in the last, like, eight years. <laughs> maybe I should, you know, call it quits. And, you know, his wife would say, no, no, you can't do that. You know, you've got to keep going. And then in 2008, you see that one flask that's a little bit cloudy? They thought this was a contaminant. You know, they thought that something had gotten in there that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and so they had to do a lot of testing, but what they realized and learned is that that one flask, the bacteria had learned to metabolize a substance that had been in there all along that was never actually intended to be food. It, it had something to do with preservative, or I don't even know what the point of it was. But the point is, is that this one flask had changed in this really dramatic way. And because the whole time they had been sampling and freezing samples of the bacteria, they could go now with molecular tools like DNA-based tools that did not even exist when this experiment started in 1988. They can go and trace the path of evolution of that trait, right? And so I love this story, <laughs> in part because it's just so cool. But also, I think it reveals something about how scientists think, right? Thinking of time as a variable in your experiment, you know? And a scientist trying to think about, you know, how can I push my science forward? Not with, you know, advanced technology. There's nothing, like, super advanced in this experiment. He just feeds the bacteria every day, day after day after day after day. And it generated some really interesting things. And he actually wants to pass this experiment on so that it will continue after he dies. I think that's the kind of story that NPR likes to tell, because there's some interesting science, but there's also something a little bit richer there about our lives and how small our lives are, and people trying to get beyond themselves and explore in new ways um, that sort of characterize the best of science. And the final category of story I, I think we're really drawn to at NPR is what my editor, Alison Richards, always calls just a good yarn. <laughs> just a good story. This is a satellite, um, IC3, that was launched back in 1978. It was launched to study uh, an area of space between Earth and the Sun, and it was doing that. 
And then in the early 80s, a lot of the world's science agencies were racing to be the first to visit a comet. They were all going to go to Halley's Comet. There was this sort of armada of space probes. You know, Russia, Japan, the European Space Agency. But NASA wasn't going to go because they thought it was too expensive. And um, some people did not like that. And uh, this guy, Bob Farquhar, um, realized that he could take this existing satellite that was just sitting there in space and fire its thrusters and send it on this really crazy trajectory that would have it rendezvous with a different comet months before these other probes would get to Halley's. So NASA became this, the first agency to ever visit a comet. And uh, the problem was the people who'd been using that satellite to like study the space weather were a little annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and so this guy said, well, we promised to bring it back. So he set it on a trajectory looping around the sun that would bring it back in the far off year of 2014. So earlier this year, one of the series of stories we did was just the efforts to reconnect with the satellite and see if it could be put back into its original position or close to it. It was a fascinating story because, first of all, there's this guy who's on this sort of personal quest, but also space communications have changed so radically in the last few decades that they had forgotten even how to talk to this thing. You know, I mean, it would be as if you've got like an old stereo in your garage, and now you're trying to somehow interface it with, you know, MP3 players and, you know, your iPhone and things like that. So it, it was just a good story. And eventually, they were not able to <laughs> get it going, but they gave it a good try. <laughs> so these categories that I've, I've sort of laid out for you, there's about seven of them, that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, I think that almost all the stories we do probably fit into one of those categories. There are some things we generally avoid. Um, we used to have a bulletin board that we called Good News for Mice. And, you know, there are always sort of cures in mice and like exciting things happening in mice. And, you know, we try to be pretty selective about those. And incremental advances, like a lot of science, which is important, extremely valuable science, um, is learning like the next step in a signaling pathway, for example. Like, unless it has something to do with something that you could really explain, even though that's like great, important science, until it reaches a certain point, we're not going to cover like every little incremental advance. Small sample sizes, that's another thing. It could be a really interesting study, but if the sample size is too small, uh, we just sort of feel like, come back when you've replicated it in a larger sample. <laughs> So in addition to these sort of categories that we're drawn to, we have this added dimension that print reporters, and that I didn't have when I was a rep print reporter, that print reporters don't have, okay? So we think about things very differently than, say, you know, a New York Times reporter would think. Um, this may seem glaringly obvious, and so forgive me if I'm just stating something that is too obvious, but it really helps for radio if the story makes noise. <laughs> you know, like, there's a reason we do so many stories about whales <laughs> and insects <laughs> and robots that clank. Um, a story about lasers, it makes no noise. <laughs> it's not to say you can't do it, it's just harder. Um, you know, we don't look at that and say, oh, that's a great radio story instantly. You know, it means we would have to think a little bit harder about how we're going to do that one. And something that's related to that is it really helps to have scientists who can talk or scientists that we can get to talk. <laughs> In print, it doesn't matter so much. You know, you could use a partial quote. Do you know what I mean? Like you could write a sentence and in the middle of the sentence you could have like a partial quote from somebody. That does not work in radio. <laughs> I can't start a sentence and then have somebody say three words and then continue the sentence. So this is a big deal for us in a way that it isn't for other outlets. And I'm going to play you some tape to give you some examples now, okay? So since this is a presentation about radio, I'm going to play some tape. Let me set up this first piece of tape by um, saying that every year we cover the Nobel Prizes. And unlike some other things where we get advance notice, you don't get any advance notice with the Nobel Prizes, okay? the Academy announces it, and you wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning or whatever, and you're at work, and you sit at their website and you hit refresh, 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 <laughs> refresh. 
and then they post who won the Nobel, and then you frantically try to figure out what this science is about because you're supposed to be on Morning Edition live in about 15 minutes explaining what it is. And we take turns, you know, there's chemistry, there's medicine, and then there's physics. So luckily for, we have some physicists on our staff. Um, this tape I'm gonna play is from David Kestenbaum when he was covering the physics Nobel. He's now covering money for Planet Money. But just to give you um, a sense of setting up this tape. So David has gone to work, he's heard who won, he's done his two-way, and so now he's going to talk to the person who won um, to, to get tape to do a story for all things considered. Now keep in mind, this person has just been woken up with this astonishing news and is now just being put on the spot, okay? So let's cut this person some slack. Could you just describe, and speak up if you can, describe yeah. as simply as you can your contribution, what you're getting the Nobel Prize for? Um, well, um, the uh, citation is for the theoretical work I did in connection with the new phases of, super, of, of heli liquid helium-3, which uh, were um, discovered experimentally in the early 70s. Uh, the experimental work uh, has, uh, in fact, received a Nobel Prize to Osharov, Richardson, and Lee. That, that I think, was in 1996. Um, what I did was basically to um, take the existing theory of superconductivity, um, as developed by John Bardeen and his co-workers here at UIUC, um, and apply it in a slight, somewhat more sophisticated form to the, um, uh, the new phases of helium-3, assuming that, they, that basically what was happening in superfluid helium-3 was much the same as is happening in superconductors, namely that you find um, pairs of particles coming together to form a sort of diatomic molecule, and that diatomic molecule then uh, under, undergoes a funny kind of transition in which all the molecules have to behave in exactly the same way. Okay, you guys got that? You get it, right? Again, he was just put on the spot. It's early in the morning. He's heard this life-changing news. But this kind of thing happens a lot, okay? A lot. And the question is, you know, how do you deal with it, right? You have to do the story. <laughs> you know, you've got to do the story soon, in fact. Um, and over the years, we've all developed different tricks, right, um, to sort of help people talk about their work. And sometimes you just give up, honestly. Sometimes you just give up. And if I got into a desperate situation, I would start asking, you know, tell me what was going on in your life, you know, when you did the science that, you know, won this prize. Like, how old were you? What are you going to do with the money, you know? <laughs> sometimes people are like, there's money? <laughs> um, and, you know, I just figure I can explain, I can explain the science, right? And, you know, Sometimes you, you help people. And this next piece of tape is a little extreme. Uh, it's by a former colleague of mine who has this unique approach, um, which you can decide whether you think it, it worked. It's not an approach I would take, but I'm not criticizing it by any stretch of the imagination. This is when uh, West Nile virus had first arrived to the United States. And um, it was starting to spread, and people were very concerned. And some of the first um, animals that were being affected were at the zoos, right? So they have exotic birds were dying, and people were finding dead birds at the zoos. And so people were scared of the zoos. And so an NPR reporter has gone to the zoo and is now talking with a zoo representative about this. I guess the important statement that we want people to under oh the important statement that we want people to understand is that zoos are part of the community in which they exist, and that community either has risk, has risk, or does not have risk, and there's no difference within the zoo boundaries than with outside the zoo boundaries. So we actually are. Risk. Oh, you didn't say that right. The community just do that again. That was great, though. I mean, no, no. Here, look. I'm. I told you this already, but I'm, I'm at the end of the bar, I'm really drunk. Uh, I want you to make this point, I want you to hold my interest, but I, you know, I am a real dumb shit, and I'm going to fall over and get a hematoma if you don't give this to me. So, and I'm convinced that I'm going to die if I go to the zoo, okay? If I go to the zoo, I'm going to die, buddy. I don't care who you are, you know? So you tell me, you got, you got 10 seconds to tell me why I don't have to worry about the zoos. Zoos are not 
any different than the surrounding area in which they exist. There's no reason to believe that that coming inside a zoo wall presents a greater risk than being outside the zoo walls. They're part of the community in which they exist. The animals here are just as susceptible as the people, and it's, it's, it's a citywide or a region-wide thing, not a specific hotspot. How do you know that? <laughs> we know that because we test our animals a lot. We test for mosquitoes. We look for mosquitoes. We actually do more surveillance inside the zoo than the cities do or the counties do outside the zoo. So we actually know our risk much more than, than say, another part of the city. And it's low. And it's very low, yeah. Thanks. See, I'm helping you. It's media oh, training. That's right. That's right. All right. So that was kind of a... People at the science desk really like that tape. Okay. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I have also found that sometimes scientists are among the most beautiful talkers you can imagine. Truly, sometimes I'm just blown away by the poetry that people use to describe their life's work. And when that happens, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> I just like listen. Um, so let me play this for you, um, just in all fairness, because it's fun to play awkward tape. But let's play some tape that I found really beautiful. This is for a little project that I did where I um, Hubble, it was some Hubble anniversary or something. And so I, I got a bunch of astronomers um, to tell me what their favorite Hubble image was and to describe it. Because oftentimes you see the Hubble pictures and they're beautiful, but sometimes it's not obvious at all what's going on in that picture, or why, other than the pretty colors, anybody would really find it very compelling. It's promising because of the way he starts. And I know instantly that it's going to be good when somebody starts the way he starts. He's going to tell us a story, OK? The story here is that in, uh, in 2002, that the red star at the center of this image uh, suddenly got much brighter. It was some kind of stellar explosion or outburst. And it was bright for several months, and then it faded back to its original brightness. So a flash of light was sent out by this star, and the light comes straight to the Earth and arrived at the Earth in 2002. But light also goes out in other directions. And in this case, the star has uh, dust particles surrounding it. So the light went out to the side, scattered off that dust, and then came to the Earth. But that light arrives later because of the longer path length. Like if someone yodels in the mountains, the, the sound comes straight to us, but it also bounces off the mountains and comes to us later. So that's a sound echo. In this case, we have what's called a light echo. So that dust was already there, but it was just completely dark, nothing was illuminating it, so we didn't even know it was there until suddenly this flash of light goes off. I like to think of when they broke into King Tut's tomb in Egypt, like uh, you, you thrust a torch into the tomb and you see all the wonders in there, uh, but then the torch goes out. So just for a few seconds you can see the contents of the tomb, or in this case the dust around the star, and then, then the uh, the light goes out, and we'll never see that dust again. So, I mean, really, what do I have to do there? Nothing. I mean, he's just so beautiful. <laughs> That's Howard Bond um, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Um, it's just so many nice things about it, you know? Like, I just feel like the information you need to know comes right when you need to know it. And he's got these great, you know, comparing it to yodeling and comparing it to King Tut's tomb, you know? And also just this idea of, um, one of the things he said that was not on that tape is he said, you know, in astronomy, you look at the stars and nothing ever changes. <laughs> and here, you know, you take a picture and then a couple months later you take another picture and it's already changed. So you've got a story now. You've got a decent talker or you're going to work around the talking somehow. And uh, then you come to the sort of part where you have to put the story together. I don't really know what a good science story is about, but I'm fairly sure at this point in my career that it's not about the science. What people remember from science stories is the little details, the little bits of emotion, the little bits of human connection, 
um, the little details that make it less about the nuts and bolts of the science and more connected to something deeper, you know, like the meaning of life or the point of it all or the universe or what it means to be alive. And it's hard to get that into a story, but it really helps a lot, I find, if you get the right person, which is not me. <laughs> I used to cover the space shuttle when the space shuttle was flying. I would go down there to Florida and cover it. And the thing that really grabbed me every time is this huge machine under the shuttle. Do you see those little tiny cars next to that huge thing? OK, that huge thing is, is a vehicle that is moving the constructed space shuttle out to the launch pad, which is over there in the corner. And this huge, huge thing is called the crawler. So I knew that I wanted to do something with the crawler. And I thought my opportunity was going to come at the last shuttle mission. Because, you know, the last shuttle mission is kind of a big event for NASA. You know, what, where is NASA going? What, what does it mean? And I thought a really good thing to do would be to profile the people who drive this vehicle as they drove it the last time out to the launch pad. Because this is obviously a specialized vehicle, OK? You can't just go buy something like this. <laughs> it gets 32 feet to the gallon. <laughs> and only about six people in the world are authorized to drive it. So my idea was that I would talk to one of those guys. And they were all guys at the time. The last time it was going to take the shuttle to the launch pad. And I thought that this would be kind of a window into the whole thing that you wouldn't normally get, right? Like normally you talk to the astronauts, or you talk to the scientists, or you talk to NASA administrators. And I thought this would be kind of interesting. So, you know, first I got him to just sort of describe what, what it was, I mean, the obvious question is, what is it like to drive this enormous thing? He told me that to understand how big this is, you know when you're driving down the highway, and it's like a regular highway where there's two lanes on each side, and there's like a grassy median in the middle? Okay, he says driving this thing is like you're driving across all of it, okay? So your vehicle is on all four lanes and the median, and you're just like going down this whole thing. And you have to keep it on the carefully constructed crawler way, which is this thing that it's on, because otherwise the weight, it'll just immediately start to sink into the ground. So this is, uh, this is a little clip from him talking about driving this thing. The speedometer in its cab only goes up to two miles per hour. With a shuttle on board, couch will go far slower than that. Even driving at 0.8 miles an hour, if you're not paying attention, it will get away from you. <laughs> so how does it handle? You've got to watch it. So because they go so slow, it takes them hours to get to the launch pad, OK? It's only like three miles away or something like that. But they go really slow. They go at night, and they take turns, you know, because they want to stay fresh. So they, you know, they, they basically are on this thing for hours and hours. And um, you know, they finally get to their destination. Couch says, when the shuttle is safely at the launch pad, an event known as hard down, the close-knit crawler team always has a little ritual. We open up a bag of chips and salsa, and there it is. And so you think for the last one it will still be chips and salsa? Or is anybody thinking about like a cake? Or I assume you wouldn't drink champagne on the crawler. No, no champagne. <laughs> But uh, it will probably be the same ceremony we have done for every other uh, hard down, is we will have our chips and salsa. So what is the point of putting that in the story? <laughs> Nobody needs to know that, right? It's just a little moment. It's just a little picture in your mind of these people, you know, just imagining them doing this year after year, and now it's this bittersweet moment where they're doing it for the last time, and they get together, and they're not going to do anything different. They're going to do it exactly the same, you know? Here's another example. I think you all recognize this. <laughs> this is the kind of picture you normally see of Earth, right? It's the picture that the Apollo astronauts sent back to us. It's very familiar. Here's another picture of Earth taken by Voyager from a distance of about 4 billion miles away on its way out of the solar system. But do you see that little blue dot there? OK, so that's Earth from 4 billion miles away. I did a story about this picture on the anniversary of taking it, because it was just such a great story about how this was taken. Um, Carl Sagan actually lobbied really hard for this picture to be taken. And there was a lot of controversy about this, because to take this picture, you had to turn Voyager back towards the sun. Um, and there was some concern that this would like fry the camera. They went back and forth, and then they finally took the picture. 
And it was actually um, part of a larger mosaic of the solar system that Voyager took. So it took pictures of all the planets. So when I want to do a story on this, who do I want to talk to? You know, I wanted to talk to the very first person who ever saw this image, right? That's who I wanted to talk to. And so I interviewed her, and as part of that, she was telling me um, this little tiny tidbit, um, which again, is it necessary? I don't know. To get the full impact of this photo, you really have to see it up on a wall as part of a large panorama that Voyager 1 took of the solar system's distant planets. Candace hansen Koharchek says, her NASA center used to have this mosaic of photos up in an auditorium. And to show the whole thing, it covered, oh, I don't know, 12 or 14 feet. Of mostly empty black space. The planets looked like little pinpricks of light. One of them was labeled Earth. One of the guys that took care of that display told me one time that he was forever having to replace that picture because people would come up to look at it and they would always touch the earth. I mean, I just like that. You know, the guy who took care of the display wanted to tell her and I wanted to tell you because it makes a little picture in your mind of people reaching up to touch this little tiny dot that is our whole existence and everything we know, just in this little tiny, tiny dot. So that's the kind of thing I think can help people feel science, <laughs> really get it in their gut. But science reporting is not all poetry. Sometimes there's some hard-hitting watchdog journalism to be done in the world of science. And we have to do it because we're reporters. And to say that we relish doing it would be an understatement. So some of you have read this already. This is a, a very succinct description of the reporting process. Number one, who's telling me this? Number two, how does he or she know this? Three, given number one and number two, is it possible that she or he is wrong? If the answer to number three is yes, find another unrelated source. Repeat, right? And let me give you an example of this. Maybe some of you remember a little event that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. There was an accident. Oil was going into the Gulf, so we were told. You couldn't really see it, though. I mean, it was under the Gulf of Mexico. It makes reporting on something like that rather difficult. All the information, really, was coming from the government and BP. That's where we were getting our information, because how else are we going to report on this one? Um, but let's go back to our graphic. Who is telling me this? <laughs> the government and BP. Is it possible that she or he is wrong? And I think it was one of the legislature um, folks, someone in Congress, got BP to release this video. This is um, one of the videos taken by the underwater subs. And so uh, my colleague Richard Harris took a look at that and thought, hmm, you know, I wonder if this is something we could use to get some sort of independent assessment of this. And so, you know, he took this video to various experts in doing things like measuring the outflow of pipes based on videos. This is the little tidbit he learned. I'll just read you from the, the web copy. The amount of oil spilling into the Gulf of Mexico may be at least 10 times the size of official estimates, according to an exclusive analysis conducted for NPR. At NPR's request, experts examined video that BP released Wednesday. Their findings suggest that the BP spill is already far larger than the 1989 Exxon Valdez accident in Alaska, which spilled at least 250,000 barrels of oil. BP has repeatedly said that there's no reliable way to measure the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico by looking at the oil gushing out of the pipe, but scientists say there are actually many proven techniques for doing just that. <laughs> In the end, I think the, the final estimates were much more in the ballpark of what Richard had. So here's another example, um, a fairly recent one I did. There's a debate within biology recently about what kinds of information should be published in the open scientific literature. So, you know, nuclear physicists are used to the idea that their research could have a so-called dual-use aspect to it, that the same sorts of fundamental discoveries you might use um, for energy production might have other uses for things like weaponization. But this is not something that biology has really had to grapple with. You know, biologists working in medicine and public health have this tradition of openness, right? That's how you advance the science. But some are saying that increasingly as technology gets more advanced that all sorts of things could be misused. And so 
there was a case where a public official in the state of California um, who runs a botulism lab discovered what he said was a new form of botulinum toxin. Now, botulinum toxin is said to be the most poisonous substance known. Our government actually stockpiles antitoxin against it in case it's used in some sort of biological attack. And when the researchers published on their finding, they did not include certain key details, things like the genetic sequence, things that could allow other people to make the toxin. And they said they were doing this because it was too dangerous to reveal the recipe um, because we would not have countermeasures against this new toxin. And so this was controversial, you know? Scientists said, well, what is gonna happen to biology if people are publishing papers and leaving out the information that scientists need to replicate the work, right? And the Department of Public Health in California said that they had kept this information secret at the behest of federal officials that there had been meetings and that it was the consensus that this was too dangerous. And I just thought, really? Did, did the federal government want this kept secret? And so the interesting thing about being a public official in California is that you're subject to the California Public Records Act. And so I did a whole bunch of records requests to show that actually federal officials did not ask for that. And moreover, the researcher for years had been refusing to share the strain or the toxin with people at the top Army lab or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, who are sort of in charge of countermeasures and protecting us. So they said that they didn't know if it was really new or if the current countermeasures worked or what. It was just this, it was very confusing. And so the story kind of changed from the California lab is keeping secrets to protect the public to what's that, what is, what is going on here? This is a little strange. That is the kind of discussion and debate that may seem like it's sort of like inside science, but it does have a resonance with the public. I mean, the public has an interest in people being able to replicate science, people being able to confirm each other's results in the process of science. And I think people find that inherently interesting, even if they're not really worried about botulinum toxin. So here's a pop quiz. <laughs> What's that? Ebola. Ebola, yes. I wanted to give you a couple examples from today's headlines to talk about how the science desk works. So I mentioned that there were these different types of desks, national, international. And Ebola is one of those stories that is a, a full science desk effort, um, but also involves other desks. So you know, we're dealing with the international desk, we're dealing with the national desk. You know, a case pops up in Dallas, the local Dallas reporter is gonna be dealing with that. Um, we have to cover everything from the US government policy to the events on the ground in West Africa. It's a huge undertaking. It involves a tremendous number of people getting very smart very quickly about something that they hadn't been thinking too much about. There are challenges just making sense of it all, making sense of the science, having to balance informing the public without panicking the public. You know, we have to stick to what we know, not speculate. Events are changing rapidly, just trying to make sure that everything we say is true. And so that's one kind of science coverage that we do. But then there are other things that are just much more individual. This slide is about one of what is kind of a lonely effort on my part. In the last few years, I've done a lot of stories on one particular study, story that I don't know if it would be getting as much attention on our air if I wasn't personally interested in it. And this is a story about whether or not it is wise and or appropriate to deliberately alter already dangerous viruses to make them even worse in an attempt to understand what they're capable of. Every once in a while, humanity has to grapple with a pandemic, usually because some animal virus jumps into people and start spreading rapidly. You know, um, you saw this with 1918 flu, for example. And so there was some research a few years ago where flu scientists took a virus that's out there in nature, H5N1, a bird flu virus that sometimes sickens people. When it does, it can be very lethal, but it hadn't really gotten the ability to spread between people. So it was kind of worrisome. People were looking at this and they were saying, what if this thing mutated? And so a couple different labs decided to see if it was possible for this virus to mutate in a way that would make it spread through the air between ferrets, which are the laboratory stand-in for people. It's the best model we have, even though it's not perfect. 
And so that's what they did. And guess what? It only takes a handful of mutations to do it. And so critics said, you have just made like a super flu, you know? Like, you have created a new risk for humanity. This was kind of the argument. It was a high profile argument, and I think that one of the things we were able to do is get people's voices on the air, people who had done the science and the people who were objecting to it, and just let people hear from them directly. Okay, so let me play you a couple pieces of tape. The first piece of tape is um, a guy named Ron Fouché. I talk a little bit, and then Ron Fouché talks. He's a um, researcher at Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands who received funding from the US government and did one of these studies. The study shows that just a handful of mutations could transform this virus into a pandemic threat. And that's important to know. For years, H5N1 has been circulating in poultry overseas. Only about 600 people are known to have gotten sick, but over half of those died. They were not contagious. Fouché says, understanding the mutations that could let this virus start spreading is essential to prepare for a possible pandemic. We are not playing with viruses just for the heck of it. You know, we're doing fundamental research to prevent public health threats. So that's what he says. And then the other argument is, this is uh, David Relman, I think, at Stanford University. What they have done is taken a very worrisome virus and made it even more worrisome to a degree that is not easily matched in nature or even in our imagination. This was a huge debate in science. Um, there was an unusual moratorium on the research uh, that was put in place that lasted more than a year. And um, after I had been covering this debate for a while, I was invited by one of the scientists to visit the secure lab where they did the research. So periodically, um, these, these labs, people don't really get to go in them, right? They're super, super secure. But every once in a while, they are shut down for maintenance. And so it was one of these maintenance periods. And so they offered to bring me in and show me around the lab. And I thought, you know, I'm going to show up, even though, if you can see this picture, I was like eight months pregnant, okay? The last thing I wanted to do was get on a plane and fly across the country, but I was going to go. And so I think that, that one of the things that we try to do in radio is bring people places, right? So I tried to get a lot of sound from the lab. Because of that, you hear about things that you wouldn't, like a, another reporter, a print reporter, would never put something like this in. We go through this door, then another, into the room where workers wearing full body protective suits would put on their air purifying respirators. An employee switches one on to show how it adds to the noise. Between the ventilation system and <laughs> this respirator, this is what you listen to. We go through another sealed door and finally reach a suite of small labs. And then I say, well, we get to this freezer, basically. You know, we're standing in front of this locked freezer and the flu samples are like right in that freezer. <laughs> and I feel like you have to take this kind of abstract debate and make it much more real for, for people, you know? Like they are right in there, like right there. And so this is what I asked uh, Yoshihiro Kawaoka, who's the guy who made them. Virologist Yoshihiro Kawaoka runs this lab. I ask if he ever takes these viruses out of his freezer. No. So they've just been sitting in that freezer for mm -hmm. over a year? Uh, more than a year, yeah, right, because after we announced the moratorium, it was just stopped. Eventually the moratorium was lifted, the federal government put more controls into place, um, but just last month, actually, the federal government instituted a new moratorium on flu and research um, on other viruses, SARS and MERS, a Middle East respiratory virus, um, because of the same concerns. They want to review it all, they want to think about it, they want to weigh the risks and benefits. So. Why have I spent so much time covering this particular story? Um, part of it is that I think it's a fascinating window into the world of science. You know, this is a truly difficult issue that has divided the scientific community, whether it's appropriate to do these kinds of experiments. And you have researchers lining up on both sides. And, you know, people who are all people of goodwill, people who are intelligent, you know, who just are disagreeing. The other issue is the public, you guys, you're paying for this research, okay? It's mostly funded by the federal government. Um, it's being overseen by our government. And both the risks and the benefits of this research are to the public. I mean, the threat of a flu pandemic is very real. I mean, we need solid flu research, you know, to understand these viruses, to understand how to defend against them. But at the same time, if you're making a pandemic threat kind of virus, 
even if there's a very small risk that the virus will ever get out of the lab, again, that's another thing that that's affects the public. It's the public that, that has that risk. So the risks and the benefits are important to the public. And I guess that brings me pretty much to the end. I just wanted to say that I am very proud to work for National Public Radio, okay? I love being able to connect with people and to try my best to delight and inform the public. It's an absolute honor. And it is an absolute honor to have been invited here to speak with you all tonight. I want to thank Science Matters and the Community Idea Stations again for inviting me. And if there's anything I can do to answer your questions, I'd be happy to.